So this morning we're continuing our study of discipleship, and we're, uh, I want to refresh you with our rules of discipleship, and they're not our rules for discipleship, they're God's rules for discipleship. Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciple, you must love God more than anyone else. We read that in Matthew 27, 37. Uh, we're called to deny ourselves and take up our cross. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. And we're going to be talking a lot about that this morning. Um, we're, we are called to forsake everything that we have. Um, just a couple weeks ago, Josh and Becky left. And uh, if you saw what they left in their house, you would be, your mouth would be dropped open because they left all their workout equipment. They left everything, their whole life they left to go live, move into a two-bedroom apartment. Gavin's going to stay across the street in a dormitory. And um, why? Because they, did, they forsook everything they had to follow Christ. I can't think of a better testimony, a better example of how we should live and how we should follow Christ. Number four is count the cost. We read about that in Luke chapter 25, uh, or ver, chapter 14, verse 25 through 34. And then finally is to follow Christ. That's really our ultimate call is to follow Christ. We are his disciples now, do you know what a disciple is? A disciple is not just someone who has a teacher and is taught by that teacher. A disciple is someone who is going to look like and act like and mimic their teacher, their rabbi. And so the disciples had this clear understanding of what it meant to be a disciple, that they forsook everything. They left their nets, left their fishing, left their jobs, and they went to be discipled. And as they went to be discipled, they started seeing this Jesus who was, who amazed them every time they saw him. And it wasn't just amazing because of the miracles that he did. It wasn't amazing because of, of all the things they saw. It was amazing because he, he, how he treated people. The, Jew, the Jews and Gentiles couldn't stand each other, but he went to the woman at the well and he'd offered her uh, light. He offered her water that, was, that would spring up eternally. And everywhere he went, he treated people with such dignity and such respect. And I, I want to uh, read a couple quotes this morning. Uh, there's an anonymous author. He says, it costs to follow Jesus Christ, but it costs more not to. See, when we follow Jesus Christ, it might be tough while we're here on this earth to follow Jesus Christ because there will be people who revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for his name's sake. There will be all kinds of things that maybe you take a stand on something and people will hate you for it. But they're not hating you, they're hating Christ. But I want you to understand that when I die with Christ, I am going to open my eyes in glory and be in heaven forever and ever and ever and ever. And we can just keep going forever. It costs to follow Christ, but it costs much more not to. The Bible says, He who has the Son has life. And whoever does not have the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. I don't know about you, but I'd rather suffer a little bit in this life and spend eternity with God than spend eternity separated from God in a place called hell. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a famous German theologian who stood against Hitler. In fact, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer tried to organize people to, to kill Hitler during, uh, during the Holocaust. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, he said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was, uh, was murdered at 39 years old. He was hanged by Hitler. David Platt said this. He said, radical obedience to Christ is not easy. It's not comfortable. It's not health. It's not wealth. It's not prosperity in this world. Radical obedience to Christ. Risk losing all things. But in the end, such a risk finds its reward in Christ. And He is more than enough for us. Sometimes we hear about these conditions. We, we look at these conditions that Jesus had for being a disciple and it makes us take a step back and go, God, Lord, that's a lot. I mean, that's a lot to ask. It's shocking sometimes, but we must understand what it means. I mean, Bonhoeffer's quote that, that when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. He's not saying that God wants us to die. We're not we're not going to go commit jihad or anything like that. But what he's talking about is we are called to die to ourselves. In other words, that I, I'm called to lay down all of, my, all of my anxiety, all of my worry, all of my stress, all of, my, all of the things that outrage me. And I am called to lay them down and say, Lord, here am I. 
Whatever the case is, Lord, I will serve you. If no one else will follow, Lord, I will follow. So I want, you, I want to reiterate what we talked about last week. Last week we talked about where discipleship happens. We talked about how being part of a local body is critical to discipleship. You cannot be discipled by yourself. Being part of a body is a way where we can encourage one another and, and push one another and help one another to follow Christ. There's a lot of talk these days about discipleship and spiritual formation, but regrettably, there's little talk about the context in which discipleship and spiritual formation is actually made possible. The context is the kingdom community. That is the local body of believers, the church. Think about it. We have access to more sermons. I mean, I can go on YouTube and watch every sermon that... Uh, pick a guy i mean adrian rogers i i watch adrian rogers all the time i can go on youtube and watch every sermon adrian rogers has preached he's been dead for a long time i can walk i can go online i can find uh i can find david platt if i want to listen to him if i want to listen to francis chan if i want to whoever i want to listen to you can go and find it it's all there in fact you can print up transcripts of their messages you can get it all laid out before you but i want you to understand that that even though we have all this access the church continues to get spiritually weaker and weaker and weaker. Especially with COVID, people stay home and they say, well, I'll watch this person, I'll watch this person. That's not being part of the church because you need us and we need you. We talked about that last week. But think about it, all this access, but we have become less and less spiritually mature. Divorce rates go up equally in the church as in the secular world. Christians have become so worldly that we look like and talk like and act like and dress like the rest of the world. Everything takes priority before God. Everything takes priority before church. Think about that for a moment. How many times do we just kind of push church aside because something better came up? Well, I thought we read last week that we were to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. See, part of the problem is that we have ingrained in our culture this individualistic mindset. You see, it's all about me. It's about my needs. It's about my wants. It's about my desires. If I don't get my way, I'll take my toys and go home. There's a little girl whose parents never disciplined her. And, uh, and she came to youth. This was a long time ago. And she was there and she sat with her boyfriend. And you know, they sit like, got to be close. And it was, it was not good. So I, ha I told them, I had to stop and say, hey, you guys need to separate. They separated about an inch and then right back together. So then I had to stop again and I put one of our adults between them. These are middle school kids. So I put one of my adults between them. And both of them are reaching around each other, the adult to try to hold hands with each other. I mean, it was really, it, it was a problem. It was a problem every week. And so I went to the parents and I said, listen, you know, this is what's going on. They got furious with me. They left the church, never called out their daughter for anything, but they'd never disciplined her before. But all of a sudden, they're, they're, up, they're so upset they're going to they're gonna leave the church. But remember that some of the scriptures that we used last week, it's because there will be conflict. When you come to church, there's going to be conflict. Why? Because there's a whole lot of personalities. There's a lot of big personalities. There's a lot of little personalities. There's a lot of medium personalities. There's a lot of personalities. And whenever you bring people together, there will be conflict. No one, does anybody else have conflict in their home ever? You bunch of liars. There's like four people that are honest back here. <laughs> She's the conflict though, right? <laughs> I told you, Glenn, you gotta, I married Mrs. Wright. When I, we stopped having con conflict when I realized her first name was always. <laughs> I'll lighten up, people. <laughs> I, I want to remind you of some of the scriptures we, um, we looked at last week. Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love. And to good works. One of the things that we're called to do when we come together as a church is to stir one another up to love each other better. To stir one another to do more good things for God. To stir one another to accomplish more for God. And he says, not neglecting. How do we, how do we, how do we stir one another up to love and good works? Not neglecting our meetings together, as is the habit of some. But encourage one another 
And all the more as you see the day drawing near. What day? The day of the Lord. Good Lord, have you paid attention to the television? Have you paid attention to the news? Do you see what's going on in our world today? I'm looking at my clock going, all right, Lord, any day now. We come together not to criticize everything that someone else does, but to encourage one another to love and good works. Why do we have men's and women's group that meet together? Some of our men's group are meeting at 5 and 5.30 in the morning, coming together so that they can encourage one another to, to love their wives better, to love their children better, to be a, good, a better dad, to be a better mom. To All of these things. Why do we come together? It's for that, so we can encourage one another to love and good works. If someone, uh, if someone challenges my thinking somebody that I trust, I am more likely to consider how I think about something. How can I trust somebody if I don't spend any time with them? I, I can't. I'll never learn to trust anybody that I'm not spending time with. And so when I spend time with people and I, and I get to know who they are, and then when they call me out, it's much, I'm much more likely to say, gosh, I never even saw that. You're right. We need that in our lives. See, not to browbeat people, but when I'm confronted by, with sin uh, by someone that I know that loves me and has my best interest at hand, it's much easier to take it from them. I told you before, my father-in-law was probably the largest discipler in my life. And he could tell me anything because he knew, I, I knew that he loved me. He wasn't coming to beat me down. He wanted to make me better. He wanted to make sure that I was following God's word, that I was doing what, he, what God said. And he would challenge me all the time. It was great. One of the things I'm going to miss about Josh, Josh challenged me so many times in so many ways. What a great thing. But that's what we are all called to do. That's, what Christ, that's why Christ put us in this church. He knit us together so that we can challenge one another, so we can encourage one another to love and good works. Look at the results in verse 34. It says, For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. These people were persecuted by the outside. They were persecuted by so many people. The Jews and the, the Christians of that time were persecuted in so many different ways. But they could let it go because they, they had a bigger picture. See, the world wasn't about what's tomorrow or what's in 10 years. The world's about what, what happens in eternity. So I want you to see my second point here is that conflict is the training ground for the disciple. Listen to that very clearly. Conflict is the training ground for the disciple. One of the costs of discipleship is that it will be challenging. John 3.30 says, He must increase, but I must decrease. Everybody say that. That's an easy verse. You can memorize that today. He must increase, I must decrease. Mike Fleming said this. He said, individualism is perhaps the most clearly seen when it comes to the issues of conflict. Cultures that are individualistic see conflict as an undesirable experience. The typical response and reaction is to remove ourselves as quickly as possible. They typically find it hard to see conflict as an opportunity to grow as a disciple. Well, there's a problem with this. When you leave, you don't die and you don't grow. See, those relationships that bring conflict they're tools of redemption designed for your long-term well-being. When it comes down to it, people grow together or not very much at all. Those that stay together and work through conflict grow. Those that leave don't. It's been an interesting week because I started to wrestle with this a couple weeks ago and thought that I was going I, I thought I was going to preach it last week as the message last week, but I needed to let it sit. And I had to process through it. And I had to say, God, can I preach this? Because there's always conflict. One of, one of the things that I don't like about my job is conflict. But there's always going to be conflict. 
It's, a, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. This week I talked with a lot of people who are having conflict with others in their lives. Pa- uh, families. Um, and those injuries are painful and they're difficult. Listen to what Gary Preston said. He said this in his book, Character Forged from Conflict. He said, when I've been significantly injured by another person, I cannot simply yank the injury from my soul and expect that all the bitterness and malice and emotion will be gone. Resentment still hides under the surface. The only way to become truly free of the offense and to forgive others is to bathe in the soothing bath of God's forgiveness of me. When I finally fathom the extent of God's love in Christ Jesus for me, forgiveness of others is a natural outflow. Listen, I'm not saying it's easy when there's conflict and we, we have to go through that sometimes and it's difficult and, we, and nobody likes conflict. I can't stand it. But when we go through it, if we go through it biblically and I decrease and Christ increase, and it's not about my way and it's not about my, what I want or how I do it, it's about Him. I decrease so He can increase. Why did Jesus say, blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all men are of evil against you falsely in my name's sake? Because that's where you grow. You you grow in that conflict. Conflict reveals your character. Conflict reveals whether or not I am trusting God in all of this or am I trusting in myself? Am I trusting my ways? See, no one wants conflict. It's not pleasant, but it is inevitable even amongst Christians. Again, the question is not whether conflict will come, but how will I handle it? As Christians, we must address it in our relationships. Why? We don't run from conflict. We need to address it. Why? Because this is how life works. What if I run from every conflict? Why are there so many divorces? Why is the divorce rate through the roof? In fact, now the divorce rate is probably going down because people just refuse to get married anymore because they say, well, if I'm, if I'm going to get married, then I'll end up with a divorce. And people say, well, then I'll have to pay all this money. I'll have to do... Listen, why is that? Because people run from conflict. Because this world revolves around them. Everything's about me. See, it reveals where my heart is on an issue. Again, James said, count it all joy when you face various trials. Not just the trials we like, because I can't think of a single trial that I liked in my life. I can't think of one. Now, I can look back and say, man, God, I see now what you were doing in that and through that. God, I don't want to go through that again. Lord, I don't want to go through another trial. Lord, but God says, hey, this is how you grow. And I can look at it now and say, yes, Lord. See, we have to celebrate it because it's, every conflict is an opportunity for me to grow. There's also an opportunity for grace. We're looking at this in context of discipleship, and discipleship is, again, an interesting word. A disciple understood the goal was to look and act like and think like and, and become like the one who was their rabbi. It's still what it is to be a disciple. We should look like and talk like and love like and forgive like Jesus. Why? Galatians 2, 20 and 21. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died with no purpose. We don't like verses like that. But that's what God wants us to do. Does Jesus want me to get hung back on the cross again? No. He wants me to put my mortally wounded sin nature, what He died for and paid the price for, put it back on the cross, and then start living like He lived. Start loving like He loved. Remember the old WWJD bracelets? Have you ever asked yourself, well, how would Jesus handle this situation? Did Jesus lash out at people who opposed him? No, he loved them. 
He's hanging on the cross and he's saying, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. When all the Jewish leaders opposed him, he didn't back down. He didn't, he didn't cower. He wasn't a... He wasn't a I, I, one of my pet peeves is this picture of this sissified Jesus because he certainly was not that. Jesus was a man's man. You know how I know that? You know those temple, temple tables when he went in and turned the temple tables over? He turned the temple tables over. Those were like 800 pounds a piece. It wasn't like our little plastic tables out there. 800 pounds a piece, and he's flinging them around. He wasn't mad. You know what he was mad at? Because they were preventing people from coming in and offering sacrifice in the temple. See, I don't have to live in that old nature anymore. Galatians 5, 24 and 25 says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to His cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. I don't have to give into that old nature any longer. When someone offends me, I don't have to take offense. Do you know that you get to choose to be offended or not? You, you have the choice. You get to choose whether or not you're offended. There's a lot of things that I could be offended by. But how am I going to reach people if, everything, if I'm offended at everything that everybody does? It, it drives me nuts when Christians are offended by non-Christians, what they do. How else would they act? They're not Christian. They don't know Christ. What, what I expect them to act any different? We're offended at Christians when they don't do their, when they don't practice their Christianity like we practice it. One of the things I love when I was coming and we were praying with um, with Daniel Giaz, and every week we talk. We probably talked as long as we prayed, but it was so interesting because the culture that he was going to and the culture that he was from was so different. But their faith was exactly the same. Their faith was in Christ alone. But sometimes people get offended because people worship in a different way or because they look a different way. See, those things that the old man does, my old nature, is not who I'm called to be now. When conflict comes, and it will come, how are you handling it? In your old nature or in your new nature? Are you running from it or are you seeing restoration and forgiveness? And are you offering grace and peace and hope? Or are you so dogmatic you're going to stand your ground no matter what? Because there's only a few hills that I'm going to die on, people. Listen, I, I, tell, I talk to you about, there's first order theology. You know what first order theology is? There's a God and He's not me. Then there's second order theology. That is that, the, that this is God's Word, that Christ is God's Son, that He was Christ in the flesh. He was God in the flesh. The virgin birth. Why the virgin birth? Because if, if Jesus was born not of a virgin, then He would have carried the sin from Adam. He's the second Adam. He doesn't have a sin nature. Very few things are second order theology. Those things I would die for. After that, there's a lot of stuff that I could let offend me and I could get all upset about and I could worry and fuss over. For what purpose is it going to bring unity? Is it going to bring help to the body? Is it going to encourage one another to love and good works? No, it causes another schism. It causes another division. It causes another strife. God says, hey, lay all that stuff down. You're my disciple. Follow me. Next point, when the going gets tough, what's the rest? The tough get going. But truth is, when the going gets tough, many people quit. Why do we have all this leaving going on in families? and churches. We know what the divorce rates are at. We also know how quickly and easily people hop from church to church. Many people never go back to church at all. In fact, this week I heard a tragic story of a family that I led to Christ a long, long time ago. And they left the church. 
And they told someone this week that they, will never, they were hurt at a church. And they said they'll never step foot in a church again. And it broke my heart. But then there was hope because there's a lady that's in our church right now that had left the church for a long time, was hurt in a church, and left for a long time, and she came back. Praise God. God, His grace reaches lower than our worst mistake, and His love runs farther than I can ever run away. He'll do whatever it takes to bring us back. 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9 says this, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reveling for reveling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. What if we lived our lives like this in our homes? What if instead of holding a grudge, what if we all had the same mind? And we all said, you know what? This is our family, and this is how we're going to do things. And everybody's in agreement with it. And then when something... Listen, we, we did this all the time. We made sure that our kids knew what the expectations were. If your kids don't know what the expectations were, how in the world can you hold them accountable? You can't. We made sure that they had the same... And we explained why. Because I said so is not a good answer. Because I said so is no answer. And, and we have this threatening and repeating parent. Stop. Honey, did you do the dishes? Did you, did you do them? Hey, I told you to do the dishes. Didn't you do them? Hey, and then, they're, then it blows up. Well, the kid didn't know if he was going to get in trouble on the first time or the 57th time. But what if we were all in line and everybody knew, hey, there's first-time obedience in our home. That was huge for us as parents, having first-time obedience. Hey, when we say something, if you don't do it, you're in trouble. And then let the punishment fit the crime. I can't, I can't tell you how many parents I've seen blow up on something that was so little, and they pun, then what they do is they punish their kids for, you're grounded for the next year, and then a day later the kids back don't. What, are you, what kind of signals are you sending your kids? But what if we lived with having a unity of mind and sympathy? Look, son, I know you forgot. I don't like it either. You were supposed to take out the trash. The trash didn't come. Guess what? Now we got to go put it in my truck. We got to go take it to the dumpster. And you're coming and you're putting it in there and you're taking it out. And so I'm going because I don't want to go, but you messed up. It's amazing how that works. And they go, oh, there's sympathy there. Brotherly love, a tender heart, a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reveling for reveling, but on the contrary, bless for those or for to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. How would we handle it if it was in our church family and someone offends you? You know what the Bible says to do? It says go to your brother and talk to them. If they won't listen, then you go to them with another brother. But you, but you know what the first part is? I've got to make sure that I'm right in my heart. Make sure that it's not just a right and wrong issue. I love this verse, 1 Peter 4.19. It's one of the verses we've been memorizing in our, in our Every Man a Warrior. It says, so then those who suffer according to the will of God That, that means that I'm lining up with what God's Word says and there's persecution because of it, that, that people disagree or they get mad or whatever. So then those who suffer according to the will of God should submit themselves to their faithful Creator and continue to do good. Well, you don't understand. My wife's not responding the way I want to and I'm trying to be nice to her and I'm trying to do this. Hey, for those who suffer according to the will of God, it doesn't let me off the hook to be, to be mean when my wife's mean. It doesn't let me off the hook to, to stir strife in my family because I'm 
making my kids angry because I'm not giving them rules that they can follow. So then those who suffer according to the will of God should submit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. How long? Forever. We've been programmed to encourage, or, and encouraged to think me first. We hear this advice all the time. You've got to do what makes you happy. You do you. You make you happy. That's heresy. That's never taught in the Bible. Galatians 5, 24 and 25, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let's also keep in step with the Spirit. You were bought and paid for with a price. We're called to live in the Spirit. You see, Satan's greatest tool is to deceive and to divide. He deceives us thinking that we can't work through an issue. And then it starts causing division. It's that little fiery dart that gets in there. And it starts festering. It starts burning. And then all of a sudden you say, I'll never work through this. We'll never be able to work through this. We'll never get through this problem. Just a simple illustration. When I was pastor, the first church I pastored in Virginia, we had a worship, uh, we had a worship leader. And, and, I, and she had just started and I, um, she had done a good job. And so I wrote, I think it was a text. I texted her something that said, hey, great job this morning. You know, the worship was awesome. It was great. And then I gave some, t- some things that I thought we could do better. And it was taken completely opposite of how I meant it to be taken. I'm gifted that way. I'll just tell you right now. But it was taken completely opposite. Of, and she was hurt. And she was defeated, and she wanted to run away. She didn't want to stay. It says, And those who belong to Christ Jesus, having crucified the flesh which is his, which, uh, with our passions and desires, we live by the Spirit, and let us also keep in step with the Spirit. See, Satan was trying to use that to divide. How can, we, how can he stop the momentum? You've got to realize Satan is always trying to stop the momentum. Maybe not Satan himself because we're too little for Satan himself. But he has legions of demons that are against the church. So what's he do? A little thought comes in and says, you know, so-and-so, I waved at them. They didn't even wave back at me. They must not like me anymore. All of a sudden this worry and stress and fret over the things that aren't even true. Nita reminds me all the time, hey, what's your verse, Chris? Whatever things are true, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any praise, think, think on these things. Why? Because my mind always runs to the negative. What did, I, did I offend somebody? Did I hurt somebody? Gosh, Lord, what did I do? Usually people come to me, if, if they come to me at all, most of the time they don't, but if they come to me at all about leaving the church, usually what, what it is is, there's no time to reconcile it. They've already made up their mind. They're already gone. You're going, but wait a second. We're the body of Christ. Aren't we supposed to work through these things together? Didn't Christ bring us here and knit us together? And listen, sometimes God calls people. Listen, I, I have no doubt in my mind that God called Josh and Becky to the ministry that they're going to. And so I want to help them every step of the way as they're walking out. If God's leading them in a direction, man, I want to be all about that. But sometimes we just leave because we're upset or we're mad or we're whatever. And and rather than dealing with it appropriately, we just leave. See, we get worked up into a frenzy and allow them to alter our thinking. I see it in divorce all the time. They can't see anything good about their spouse. Why? Because it's already, they've already determined in their mind. I, I shared with you before, I had a couple come in and tell, she said, I can't stand the way he eats cereal. <laughs> You're divorcing him because of the way he eats cereal? No, you know what happened? There was an issue a long time ago that never got resolved. And then all of a sudden, it, it became a foothold in their it became a foothold in their relationship, and that was never dealt with. So it became this stronghold in their relationship. It was never dealt with, and now it impacts every part of their lives. 
That's what bitterness does. I've seen this so many times that, that you allow Satan to get a little foothold and all of a sudden you believe this stuff and then all of a sudden he's got a stronghold and then all of a sudden it impacts every part of my life, everything they do. You can't have a relationship. You can't have anything because it all just comes back over. Jesus called us to the ministry of reconciliation. Yes, the reconciliation of souls, bringing them to Christ. But how about how am I going to bring people to Christ if I can't reconcile the relationships that I have within my own family, within my own community, within my own church, within my own small group? See, that's part of the ministry of reconciliation. Because how am I going to reach lost people? I, I shared with you before this book I read, Concentric Circles of Concern. And the whole first part of the book was going through and it was like, okay, think real hard and pray about are there any broken relationships in your life? Any broken relationships in your family? Because you've got to fix those first. And you start with your immediate family and I'm going, no, I don't have any broken relationships there. I don't have any broken relationships there. And it was like, it was like chapter after chapter after chapter and I'm like praying and I'm like, oh man, my real father... I haven't talked to him in 40 years. I was like, but that's not my fault, God. That's his fault. I mean, I was just a baby when he left. Chris, that's a broken relationship. But God, I'm not ready for that. I don't want to go to him. I don't want to tell him. What do I say? Hey, I'm your son. I haven't talked to you in 40 years. Here I am. And I'm telling you, I wrestled with it and wrestled with it. And I made every excuse in the world why I can't reconcile that relationship. But as I go through the book, I realize, then how am I going to reach anybody for Christ? And God convicted me, and I called him. He came down to see us. Was it easy? No. But it's not a broken relationship anymore. We don't, have a, we don't have a relationship like normal father and son. He's not my father. My father was the guy that raised me. But we have a relationship now. Church, we are called to the ministry of reconciliation, of fixing broken things. Fix whatever's broken in your marriage. Fix whatever's broken in your family, that your extended family. Fix whatever's broken, whatever relationships are broken in the church. Finally, group discipleship over individual discipleship. It's interesting that we go through the New Testament, we see these community of believers helping one another out. In fact, we, we read about it in Acts when they had all things in common. Everybody sold everything they had, sold all their possessions, brought it to the church, and then they divided it. Listen, and it didn't work very, it didn't work very well, but it was a picture of what heaven's going to be like. It can't work because we have sinful nature and there's sin involved. But until recently, the church held this, what's called a collectivist view of society. That is that the church practiced the good of the group over the individual. Listen to our instructions from Scripture. Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Do nothing out of selfish, vain glory, or selfish ambition, or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking at your own interest, but each of you at the interests of others. Romans 12.10, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. What if we looked at these things from, the perspect from that perspective, that we could help people or we valued other people above ourselves. And all of a sudden, I start to decrease and God increases. And all of a sudden, he starts healing those relationships. Why? Because instead of me getting all offended and getting all upset and getting all worked up, I go, Lord, it's not me, it's you. Lord, you value this person. They need somebody. They're hurting. And God, you put me in, in their way and you put me in their life. God, help me to surrender to you. See, when Jesus tells us to die to self, that's what he's talking about. I've got to lay aside my will and accept his will even when I don't like it. 
You see, this is the cost. This is one of the costs of discipleship. Is I've got to take my self-will and my pride and all the sinfulness in me and lay it aside and say, okay, Lord, I don't like it, but God, I need to reconcile this relationship because you deserve all the praise and honor and glory. Lord, you reconciled people. You came and brought them the faith in you. And you loved the people that persecuted you. Am I a disciple? Do I love God more than everyone else? I'm not going to go through it all. But that's what discipleship is. It is to die to my desires, to die to myself, to yield to a better way. The problem is sometimes I don't believe it's a better way. But I want you to know it is a so much better way. It is where we start seeing people come to faith in Christ. It's where we start seeing people lay aside all of this stuff and God gets the glory in it all. So the question for you this morning is, are you a disciple? Not have you said a sinner's prayer. Are you a disciple? Are you a follower of Christ? Because if you're a follower of Christ, if you made a decision that Christ, you can be Lord of my life, then he's going to either be Lord of all or not Lord at all. Maybe God's dealing with you this morning about something. I don't know what God's dealing with you with. with. Maybe it's your family. Maybe there's some, there are some struggles in your family. Well, Dad, you're the head of the household. Go make it right. Not with an iron fist, but with love, considering her more than you. Is there a problem with your kids? Are you provoking your children to wrath? because you're not having first time, because you don't have some rules set, some basic rules set in your home. They don't know where they stand. They don't know if, it's gonna, if I'm going to be in trouble the first time or the 57th time or the 322nd time, and then it blows up and all, all chaos breaks loose. And then they're going, man, I don't even know what I did. Church, that's what discipleship is. It's how to live our lives daily following Christ. Yielding myself to the other person because Christ yielded himself for me. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Look, I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know what God's dealing with you about, but there is a cost of discipleship. And the cost of discipleship is that I am going to lay down all of my priorities, all of my pride, all of that. Lord Jesus, I'm going to submit to you and I'm going to trust you because you're faithful. God, I don't know how it's going to work out, but that's okay. I was thinking about, I I talked to Josh a couple times this week, and I was thinking about, I I was just talking to him about how things were working out. And it's just awesome to see what God's doing. And we could see it before he ever got there, but you know, when you take that step of faith, you don't know how it's going to work out. It's a step of faith. And I'm telling you, if there's a problem in your home and you're going, I don't know how how this is going to work out if I confront this problem or if I deal with this issue, she might leave me. Listen to me. Submit yourself to your faithful creator and continue to do good. Okay, God, I'm trusting you. And then open up with prayer with your wife. There's something disarming, disarming about prayer. When Nita and I pray together, it's like everything else goes away. We're both standing open before God. He knows everything that we've done. It's amazing when we pray together how it just disarms us both. So I don't know what God's dealing with you about, but maybe this morning you say, Pastor, pray for me because I'm struggling. There's some areas of my life that I'm struggling with. And I want to make sure that I'm following Christ and that I'm doing the right thing, that I'm being the disciple that I'm called to be. Maybe it's an issue in your home. Maybe it's an issue with the church or with a friend or with somebody else. I don't know, but maybe God's dealing with you. If that's your prayer, will you slip up your hand so I can pray for you quickly? Amen. Amen. How about you? Maybe you're here today and you say, well, I said the sinner's prayer, but I can't really say I'm a disciple because I don't really follow God. God's dealing with me this morning, and today I want to make sure it's, I get it right. I want to be, be a follower of Christ. If that's your prayer this morning, will you slip up your hand so I can pray for you? 
Listen, in just a moment, we have a hymn of invitation. But let's stand for prayer. Father, we come before you today and we thank you. God, I thank you that instead of looking at my sin and my destitute and my worthlessness, instead of looking at me and passing me by, Lord, you said, I will send my son to die for you, a sinner. God, I'm so grateful for that. And Lord, and how with all that you did for me, as I bathe in that forgiveness and that grace that you offered me, how can I do anything but offer grace? God, it's not easy. Lord, it wasn't easy for you to send your son to die on Calvary to pay for my sin, but he did it. God, it's not easy to go reconcile relationships with people, Lord, but God, that's who we're called to be, Lord. We're called to a ministry of reconciliation. So God, as we have people who've raised their hand this morning, Lord, I don't know what they're, what's going on in their lives, Lord, but you do. And God, you're the healer. And you're the protector, and you're the one who has the answers for it all. So God, I pray you'll bless the invitation. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.